Hey folks, how you doing? It's been a while. Like I said in a previous video, I've been pretty busy on personal admin, making plans for the future actually. So I haven't strayed far from home. I'm just out for the, the afternoon, really. I'm in the van, a wee bit coastal walking in a bonny village, but you can probably detect a bit of movement around the van. It's fairly busy. It's not exactly wilderness out there. However, I thought I would use this opportunity for a wee channel update, just let you know that I'm ticking along, doing okay. And also, use this as an opportunity to do a wee bit of a review, is that the right terminology? I've got to be careful with my words here. To talk a little bit about the Eldest CV40, the camper van, and how it's shaping up as a base camp for my outdoor adventures. So I've got a cup of coffee on the go. We'll enjoy a coffee and a blether together. I'll give you a wee roundup of the first month or so with the van, let you know what my thoughts are, how I feel it's doing. So the first major trip with the um, camper van was to the Outer Hebrides. We had a few days in the Inner Hebrides on the island of Skye before we sailed across to the Uists. And we didn't really uh, do any particular preparation. I thought we'll just wing it, we'll see how the, the van goes. But I'm quite familiar with van camping. So going back in time, my first venture into sort of van camping or camper vanning, not sure what the terminology is, was with my old Land Rover. And that was a short wheelbase Series 3 Land Rover. But I had a roof tent on top, I also had a platform up there as well. And although it was a short wheelbase, I had a configuration inside that allowed me to flip the front seat, the passenger seat forward, and then I put a platform in there and I could sleep in the back and I could cook. Actually, I had a wee cooking rig set up that uh, clipped on top of the steering wheel. So, so I had a lot of adventures in that and I, I loved the um, four wheel drive uh, capability of that it was great especially for winter camping in Scotland kept that vehicle for 25 years or thereabouts had it for a very long time <laughs> it wasn't on the road for 25 years it spent a fair bit of time on and off the road both uh, literally and metaphorically <laughs> quite a lot of time in the garage or in my own garage in the workshop and then I I had my uh, Renault traffic van, a self-build camper with a bunk in the back and I also had a roof tent on that. That was quite a fancy roof tent actually, one of these pop-up hard shell ones. And, and that was great. Both of these vehicles were rigged or set up specifically for my outdoor adventures. And although at one point my Land Rover was in really good condition, actually featured in the Land Rover magazine um, because of the quality of the restoration on it but I bought the vehicles to use and and so they became pretty rough around the edges fairly quickly with canoes on top kayaks and tents and ice axes crampons and ropes and you name it all sorts of outdoor paraphernalia bicycles everything and that's what I particularly liked about my Renault van, about the self-build, was that it was a relatively cheap vehicle and I could treat it fairly harshly and not to, uh, worry too much about it. 
it was there very much as a service vehicle to allow me to get to the hills and do what I want to do. So what about this rig? This is a wee bit more expensive, certainly a lot more comfortable. So how did it, how did it do? So I would say overall that the Elder CV40 exceeded my expectations as a base vehicle for my outdoor activities in Scotland. I was maybe a wee bit surprised at that. The vehicle is perhaps a little bit more robust inside than I thought. It's certainly got, you know, there's a lot of soft furnishings and, and so on. And in the earlier video that I made of the van, when I very first got the van, I mentioned that I stripped quite a lot of stuff out. So I'll show you around the van in a wee while. But um, almost the first thing I did when I took delivery of the van, when I got home, was I stripped all the carpets out. I took loads of the cushions out. And I took, there's in the, um, the sort of living area, at the rear of the van that converts into the sleeping area there was additional cushions and so on in there and I just took all of that stuff out partly because I thought it's just going to get damaged and also because it's potentially going to get in the way when I'm storing my outdoor gear and I think that probably helped to make the, the vehicle a little bit uh, more robust As I say, overall, I'm pretty pleased with it. So I think one of the strengths of the vehicle is its uh, size. It's a six meter vehicle. It's actually 5999 and that is quite important. It's important for me insofar as I spend quite a lot of time on Calmac ferries and anything over six meters um, is 50% more expensive to take on the ferries. Now, it wouldn't be a deal breaker if you were only going on the ferry once a year or maybe a couple of times a year but if you're tootling backwards and forwards especially on the longer routes to the outer Hebrides then the additional cost of taking a bigger vehicle would perhaps uh, make you think uh, carefully so at six meters I find the vehicle very drivable, it, it is easy to handle and I think I think most people would probably not have too much difficulty driving a vehicle of this size. I do have a kind of background in driving heavy vehicles and uh, operating fairly big machines just as part of my work life really so although I do have a familiarity with big vehicles I don't think that driving this van would pose much of a difficulty for anyone even on the single track roads in the highlands it, it handles well and it's got plenty of power so it climbs the hills and and at six meters long it's got enough space in it so it's bigger than the the wee Renault that I used as the the, the base vehicle for my self build and just having that little bit of extra space it gives you more livability you're not constantly moving things around with a wee van I always felt that I had to empty a space before I could use it so you were forever transporting equipment or goods from one end of the van to the other end of the van so that you could um, you know enjoy a bit of freedom and a bit of space in one particular zone. I think I mentioned in the earlier video that I made on this vehicle that I consider it as a, a series of different zones so I'm sitting here um, in the passenger seat the driver seats over there so this is the um, this is really the the sort of galley uh, area, dining area. So the tripod is actually sitting on top of the the little dining table, and there's a um, a two seat sofa behind behind you there that's also rigged for uh, taking people on the road. In other words, there's uh, seat belts on it, so um, I can carry uh, three passengers plus the driver. So rigged with four seat belts and then over here in zone two is the um, the kitchen you saw that when I was making a cup of coffee at the start of this video and then in behind that there is storage but there's also the toilet and the shower and then the final zone is right at the back um, which is a, a kind of rear lounge come sleeping area well during the 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 daytime when I'm moving around if I'm in transit 
the rear of the vehicle is used mostly for storage so I can put all the bedding and everything up and I can put um, you know some of my gear there and then simply use this forward galley area this dining area uh, if I pull over as we have done now for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something like that it's quite comfortable so never really feel that you're short of space and for me that's a, a big bonus the idea of the journey is to get to the hills and then to enjoy the hills and spend as much time out and about as possible and not too much time messing about with the livability of the the vehicle or the base camp so I've spun round I've changed seats I'm now sitting in the the two passenger seats that I mentioned and the driver seat and the passenger seat uh, the front passenger seat is in behind you there just to give you an idea of the the vehicle and during the the day when I'm driving around this is the area of the vehicle that we use most this cupboard here is that visible uh, that's uh, these two cupboards there are, are food storage cupboards there's the sink over here which I'll turn the camera in a second and, and show you that's where we keep the equipment for tea and coffee and then the cooker is there so this little area um, for daytime use is um, really important keep this clear don't use this for storage at all in the evening when we set up the bed if there's anything in the back that needs to be moved it can just come up here and actually mostly it can just sit under the table here so this is the the drawers that I mentioned and we keep the um, cutlery and basically the the kitchen tools are in there teas and coffees in here and then that is also uh, cooking equipment there so I have my pocket rocket stoves and um, little gas containers and so on because the vehicle is set up uh, largely for camping so I need also in addition to storing the stuff that you need for van life I need to store the stuff that is used during uh, camping trips and then this wee table flips up and in here there's not very much in there just now there's a few torches and some batteries and things like that but that's where I keep all the electrics uh, spare batteries for the cameras um, the charging pods for the cameras uh, the cables for my laptop computer and uh, telephone and so it all just goes into uh, into that drawer there and and some power banks and so this is quite an important drawer and it just it sits in there that comes down like that so not a drawer that I need into you know every uh, every few minutes when we're, we're parked up it's something that I might just go into every now and again to get a cable ready for charging I'll talk about power in a wee while as well and how we do actually charge things up when we're on the road and so this is the wee galley area there sit relax enjoy our tea or coffee eat our meals and and this is where they're prepared so there is an electric uh, ring there and then there's two gas rings here the controls for the gas are at the bottom of that cupboard this is a, a storage area for plates and uh, cups and so on microwave here I'll talk a wee bit about that uh, later and there is an oven uh, in here as well and then also an area where we store pots and pans the living area at the front of the van works really well for either daytime travel as I've previously mentioned but also when you come down off the hill or if you come in from the fishing or off the water if I've been paddling to have this free space where I can get a brew on I can sit down I can get my boots off I can relax kick back a little and I don't have gear to move around it just creates a nice relaxed feeling to the base camp being able to come in and, and you know park myself in a comfortable seat enjoy a cup of tea and then decide what I'm going to do with the rest of the day or the evening so Mo's actually helping me shoot this wee video and there isn't really enough space in the van to set the tripod up every time so if there's a little bit of uh, 
well, there's a wee bit of camera shake it's because this is handheld but uh, I wanted to show you the the front section of the van but from a different angle and specifically I wanted to talk about this over cab storage area and so it's quite a, a narrow entrance but it's quite deep in terms of it goes right across to the windscreen there and it's absolutely perfect for keeping my collection of rucksacks so there's three rucksacks in there uh, each of a different size there's a bigger rucksack that if I decide that I'm going on an overnighter if I'm leaving the comfort of the van behind and I'm taking a tent then that rucksack is in there it's on the bottom there's a medium sized rucksack that I could just about use for an overnighter uh, if I was going pretty light and not carrying too much gear um, but it's also quite good for a long day in the hills where I'm carrying a lot of camera gear and then I've got my old Crux AK-47 rucksack sitting right on the top which you've seen in countless videos so that collection of rucksacks fits in there quite nicely and they're out the way but they're they're to hand if I need them so in the morning if I'm getting up and you know getting ready to go out and about what I don't want to do is to kind of disrupt the whole vehicle to find what I need to pack for a, a day trip or um, whether that be a day in the hills or a day at the fishing or whatever I want things to have their place and I want to be able to retrieve them from the van without disrupting everything else so it works really well I also keep a few other things in there they're not necessarily in there just now because like I say I'm not actually uh, heading off to the wilderness I'm only uh, half an hour from home to be honest I keep uh, I keep my possibles pouch in there that goes into my rucksack wherever I go um, in the in the wilds of Scotland and that's got things like my GPS a head torch it's got a wee first aid kit it's got a waterproof notebook and a pencil and the the various bits and pieces that you would take almost as a matter of course if you're going any distance from the road in Scotland so I keep all the, the stuff like that in there I keep my map case and, and and so on it all lives in there and so when I get up in the morning and I'm packing, it's really easy. The stuff is to, is to hand. So talking about packing up and uh, heading off into the hills or on the water for a day, I just want to show you this wee compartment uh, here. I'll take this out. This is ferry tickets for the Hebrides. This little glove box or whatever you would call it, this wee compartment is perfectly sized for the um, Land Ranger maps. They just sit in there very nicely in two rows and I don't know how many is in there. There's, I'll give them a quick count for you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's 20 maps in there. And then my, um, my DEET for insect uh, treatment uh, insect repellent uh, is in there as well and then there's just enough room to pop my ferry tickets on the top and it's all neatly stored so that's a really usable space very functional for uh, using the van in, a, a, in an outdoor sense you know um, what, what I'm doing here remember folks is I'm not giving a review on this van as you might expect if I was living in caravan parks or camping sites this is for wild camping this is for uh, exploring the wilder parts of Scotland and I'm just really explaining on on how I live with the vehicle and and how I've set it up so talking about all the wee kind of glove boxes or storage compartments or whatever they're called these days the the door, both the doors actually in, in this vehicle, can I open it? You can maybe see it a bit better if I do that. They have really usable um, door pockets there. There's there's two of them. This is Mo's door, so I'm not quite sure what is in the top. Um, I keep various bits and pieces in the top of mine. But in the bottom, that big compartment at the bottom there, it works really well as a storage area for your waterproof trousers and your waterproof jacket and also for your um, bug shirt so 
if you're getting out and about and it's uh, raining when you pull up you don't have to dive into the back to search out your waterproofs they're there uh, just beside your your hand and also I'll close the door for the vehicles going past um, if there's hordes of midges about you don't have to rake around and, oh what did I do with my bug jacket it just lives in there so you just put your hand down put the jacket on and you can dive out so talking about bugs and bug jackets and midges the, um, let me see if I can get this for you so that's a that's a bug jacket and that is fine enough for keeping out the midges in Scotland Let me put that back. but the bug screens on the on the windows where's the easiest one to show you possibly this one here it's probably difficult for you to see that camera is not going to um, necessarily pick it up very clearly but what I can tell you is so there's a there's a blind uh, and, and also there's a bug screen what I can tell you is the bug screen that is fitted to this vehicle is not suitable for protection against midges the midges will get through for sure we can uh, testify to that and actually when I saw it I immediately knew that that was going to be an issue so it keeps out keeps out the clegs it keeps out the blue bottles and the black flies and and it keeps out some of the midges but if there's swarms of midges you see them landing on it and you can see them working their way through the the, the wee holes and that's something that I'm going to have to address because I do a lot of summer camping in in Scotland and to get away from the midges I invariably camp right on the coast or on the mountain tops and it's going to be quite difficult especially on the mountain tops with a vehicle so so basically um, the idea of the van is is a bug free zone for summer camping and and therefore I need to address the issue of the bugs being able to get in it's okay if it's a cool evening uh, because there's enough ventilation in this vehicle that you don't need the windows and things open or the door open so this door here I can open this door completely and excuse me I'll be out of shot here probably um, if I can just do that so you can see that on a warm evening I could actually sit with the door open and have this screen going all the way across except it doesn't work for midges so I'm just going to pop it back. I do have somewhere. So this is what I used in my old vehicle. So I bought this in the ship's chandlers in Ullapool. And, and this material works extremely well. So what I did with my old uh, van, I just attached this um, as a screen over the windows I actually just hooked it in through the door closed the door and then I kept it in place with a whole series of small magnets so I'm gonna have to to do something similar with the bug protection uh, the bug screening in this van this material is way too soft so you saw when I pulled out the screen on the door there that it kind of holds a shape well th this wouldn't it would all just uh, crinkle and crumple up so so I think I'll probably just do as I did with my my old van the self build or my old Land Rover just use um, this midge netting and magnets it works really well it's very simple and when I take it down in the morning and I'm you know jumping in and and getting ready to hit the road I just take the magnets off and there's always a place you know whether it's just there beside the handle or something the magnets are pretty powerful you just put them against them they drop them on the metal and it, it, it's a storage area for them so you you never lose them I use little rectangular ones they're like little bars of gold tiny little bars of gold um, they're quite powerful and you just pop them round the window holds the midge netting in place and it works perfectly well so 
So that's one thing that um, I, I wasn't disappointed. I knew that it was going to be an issue um, from the, the the moment that I looked at the Elder CV40 and, and considered it as a suitable uh, or a possible base camp. You may have seen in one or two of my other videos that um, I had this in my old van and, and sometimes, although it's quite bulky, it's not particularly heavy, but it is quite bulky, I sometimes um, throw it in my backpack as well, in my rucksack when I'm uh, camping, especially if I'm going to be sitting outside the tent. So this is one of these uh, thermocells and this is the, the gas that it uh, burns to heat up the plate. So basically there's a plate behind there and then there's these little... Um, impregnated pads that have got a type of insecticide in it so that's the pad there this one's spent I'm not sure that you should be touching these with your bare fingers but um, like I say this that's an old one and and I've just got one of these gripper things on it and in the old van I just positioned it there and left the door open and it sends out um, a smoke when you uh, when you light it you just uh, flick that across and then you ignite it like that I'm going to turn it off I don't want it running just now and I just had it there and generally speaking it was enough you know if the midges were light it kept most of them out um, if the midges were were bad I would probably have this running but I would also have my midge net on as well so I'd have kind of double uh, protection in this van what we did on one or two of the warmer evenings where we needed ventilation and um, the midges were quite troublesome I didn't have my magnets with me so I couldn't easily set up the midge net over one of these windows but I was able to open up the roof light here just like this I don't know if you can see that so I opened that up and that gave me uh, full uh, ventilation and um, you know the heat rises obviously I know that you know that and I just uh, simply hooked up up there um, like that I also uh, pulled the, the, the mid screen across just as a little bit of a, an extra deterrent the other thing that you can do with that open if you put the, um, the shade instead of the mid, mid screen but you don't get nearly as good ventilation or you can do kind of half and half something like that um, but actually, uh, I found that um, with the thermocell and the the bug screen and the fact that it was quite high up and the, the hot air was rising, creating a draft out of the vehicle, didn't get many midges coming in from the top at all. So, so that worked uh, that worked quite well. And do the thermocells work? I've seen loads of reviews on on. Uh, online about them some people rave about them and other people say they're not that good well I think it's something else in your uh, armory that you can uh, use to make life bearable when the midges are really swarming I, I have no regrets about um, investing a wee bit of money in this I think it, it, it works um, reasonably well it works in combination with other systems so the thing to remember when you bring stuff like this into the van you've got to store it so under this seat here there is a very small amount of um, storage space and, and that's because a lot of the van heating equipment is in there so although it might seem like a big space in fact it's quite um, small but it's, uh, it's just big enough to keep a few essential items I keep my searchlight in there and uh, a few other uh, bits and pieces in the summer I'm not going to need the searchlight very often so I don't have to have it to hand it just uh, lives in there but that's my advice that's my top tip think carefully about what you bring into the vehicle and and only bring it in if you need it if you think that you can get by without it then don't use it uh, to simply clutter up the inside of the, the, the vehicle. Try and take a minimalist approach. Bring in what you need and, and, and need what's in here. So I want to talk a little bit about the 
the delicate matter of living wild for three or four weeks at a time. It's, it's an important part of uh, van life to have good hygiene and that's where the shower really comes into its own. And it's equally important to care for the environment as much as you're caring for yourself. And what I'm referring to now is um, the delicate matter of going to the toilet. And, and how do you do that? Well, this has got a, what people often refer to as a chemical loo. We don't use this as a chemical loo. And the reason for that is because the chemicals are not easy to dispose of. So, how personal do I get? What we do is, if you simply need a pee, then we can have a pee in the toilet. And what we put in the toilet to make sure that there are no odours is uh, eco-friendly liquids. I'm not going to tell you what the trade names are. There's lots of them and you can find them online. And there are no chemicals in them. So they're completely biodegradable. And, and therefore, emptying the canister becomes a whole lot easier. So if you're away from any chemical loo disposable, uh, disposal point for an extended period, there are still ways that you can get rid of your waste because basically it's just urine and water. And as long as uh, you're careful about where you're disposing of that in nature, you shouldn't run into any problems. In terms of more serious business, then there's also ways around that. And, and really, that involves, if you're going out into the hills all day, then just take a trowel with you and, and just um, uh, do your business in nature as you would do if you were wild camping. Just make sure that you're a good long distance away from the, the road. I prefer to be you know, between 500 metres and 1,000 metres, so up to a kilometre away from roads, uh, away from habitation, away from people, obviously away from water courses and so on and so forth. If you do use the, the, the toilet in the, the vehicle, then that's okay. But what I do as a, you know, because essentially I'm using this vehicle for wild camping not dirty camping. The two sadly have become synonymous um, in 2020, but they're not. They're very different things. So using this as a base for wild camping, if you go to the loo in here, then you need to bag your waste. And that allows you potentially to, to bin it. But then you have to be really careful about the type of bin that you would put it in. Basically, um, throughout many parts of Scotland, you'll see areas where there is disposal, disposal bins for dog waste. So um, bagging and binning into a facility such as that is not going to cause any council worker any difficulty. What you can't do is just go to the first bin that you come to and throw it in because some of that material might be uh, recycled and so you're contaminating material and also you're creating a, a hazard. Remember that hu human waste is toxic, it's hazardous especially to animals but also to humans. So, um, if there isn't a, a facility to bin it, then you can bury it. But of course you need to use biodegradable bags. So you can get um, uh, brown paper bags that are sufficiently waterproof to enable you to use them. They're quite expensive. They're actually they're not quite expensive. They're very expensive. They're sixty pounds for a hundred, but there are cheaper alternatives as well. You can get um, uh, bags that look like plastic bags, but they're not plastic. I think they're made from some sort of food waste or something. I'm not quite sure what they're made from, but they they have a very rapid um, uh, a period of degradation and so they're okay to um, to bury but just in the same way that um, you wouldn't go to the loo 10 meters from the side of the road you wouldn't 
bury your waste that's come from the van 10 meters from the side of the road you're going off to the hills you just um, take your waste with you you get 500 meters a kilometer more um, into the hills you find a suitable spot you dig a hole and bury it and if it's possible flip over a stone a big stone dig a hole there bury the waste put the stone back and then no animals going to be able to dig it up so so that's how uh, that's how we use the facility uh, here these facilities also when we're showering and things uh, because we have grey water there's a wastewater tank here so moving away from the toilet tank there's a, a second tank uh, so there's three tanks in this there's a, a clean water tank there's a grey water tank and then there's the uh, effluent that is generated from the toilet uh, the grey water tank it's fair enough to empty that down a drain providing you're not filling it full of chemicals so again when we're doing washing up and stuff like that we use the um, eco detergents you can find all sorts online they're a wee bit more expensive but well, basically I think it's something that you should be doing uh, I don't think there is a choice I think uh, if you're going to be enjoying the wilds uh, the wilds of Scotland then uh, treat them with care and respect so I was talking for five minutes there about toilets time to change the subject although it is quite a, an emotive issue this year anyway moving on to electric so have this little uh, 12 volt uh, fridge here with uh, the freezer compartment let me tell you a little bit about how we use that this is Mo's knowledge of uh, food and food preparation that has led us to use the refrigerator like this when we're uh, cooling everything down we tend to put it on a really high setting cool everything down really uh, low and and then um, switch it off to preserve the 12 volt system so I've got extra batteries in this so I've got a bank of batteries under the seat at the back here so I do have quite a lot of um, power stored but uh, mostly because of filming and so on and so forth I actually do draw quite a lot of power as well we enjoy a very kind of heavily vegetable based diet so keeping things cool is not all that important we can store a lot of food um, without using the refrigerator too much but some um, some of the food needs to be uh, put in the refrigerator some of the vegetables and, and also if we've got milk or if we do have um, sometimes we'll have a bit of meat or quite often fish um, especially if I can catch them and in that uh, instance what we would probably do is we'd start it off in the, um, in, in the fridge but then uh, we'd leave the fridge off overnight although it's got a it's got a setting on it it's got a nighttime setting to keep it quiet and and to reduce the amount of power that's pulling but what we tend to do is to take any uh, uh, temperature sensitive stuff out of the fridge and put it into the freezer unit which is a whole lot uh, colder and that worked really well for us uh, during the extended road trip that we made to the Outer Hebrides but the other thing that we did in terms of um, uh, cooking and and producing hot water and cooling uh, the refrigerator down we used the generator so what I can say is on the the Uists, so actually on the southern part of the Hebridean archipelago there is um, no access to pumped gas so this vehicle uses pumped gas it doesn't use bottled gas so we carried some of these little gas canisters that I showed you earlier which are um, you know great if you just want to make a cup of tea or whatever or especially if you're going into the hills and you're um, you want to take some cooking facilities with you but having all this gear here it doesn't make sense you know cooking on tiny wee camp stoves so we um, preserved as much gas as possible because we knew that on Vattersea, on Barra, on Eriski, on South US, Benbecula, North US, we weren't going to be able to refill the gas tank. There is uh, pumped gas available when you uh, cross over onto Lewis and Harris. There's a place up in Stornoway where they have uh, pumped gas. 
but we knew we were going to be on the road for a long time and we wouldn't have access so we were conserving gas and the way that we did that was by using electricity and the way that we uh, secured access to ele electricity was to generate it ourselves so we carry a little generator so let me show you that so this is a generator that I carry let me unzip it so this is a waterproof bag well it's sold as a waterproof bag but my advice to you if you're going to leave this out overnight in heavy rain is to drop a tarp over it as well but it's uh it's reasonably well constructed and it certainly keeps any odour uh, from the, the generator um, at bay. Although you do have to ventilate every now and again. So when, when you pull over, it's a good idea to ventilate and to let any fumes that have built up, uh, let them escape. Um, let me see if I can climb in and show you this generator. So this is, um, it's a Ford generator, it's a FG2000IS, um, so it's a 2 kilowatt generator but um, it has a 2 kilowatt startup but it, um, I think it's good probably for about 1.8 kilowatt, something like that. That, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it produces sign power so it's one of these quiet generators. I have a 25 meter cable. When the cable is fully extended, this generator at the end of it and the van at the other end, I can't hear the, the generator in the vehicle at all. The generator runs, if I'm just charging camera batteries or um, charging up the leisure batteries that are under this uh, sofa here, then the generator is running very, uh, at very low uh, RPM very quiet. If I use the generator for heating or for hot water, um, so the hot water system in here I can uh, heat water on gas alone, I can heat water on gas and electric together and I can also uh, heat water on one kilowatt of uh, electricity, two kilowatts of electricity or three. So normally what I do is I put the hot water system on, um, on one kilowatt, um, I run I connect the, the van up to the generator and, and so the revs go up a little bit because it's drawing the, the van's drawing a fair amount of power but there's still enough surplus uh, power produced that I can continue charging my computers or camera batteries or electric toothbrushes or whatever. Um, and, and so this uh, works really well. It takes about mm, 20 minutes to heat up enough water for a shower. I think I read some place that the hot water tank in this is enough for two people to have a shower. I don't think that's true. I think the hot water uh, tank is enough for one person to have a decent shower, uh, which is what you need really if you've been out uh, working hard on the hills all day and you come back and you want to have a decent wash and then put some clean fresh clothes on. You don't want to be you know getting out the shower before you feel that um, you're properly clean so so it takes about 20 minutes uh, for uh, the the hot water tank to fill up and then you can have a decent shower and then if somebody else is having a shower you need to keep it running for another um, 20 minutes so so it's a, a mid-range generator there's cheaper ones available and um, there's also much more expensive ones but I'm quite familiar with this uh, generator, never had any problem with it, I think it's been a good purchase and the van seems to be quite compatible with it. But you plug a generator into your camper van at your own risk, I'm not, a, uh, I'm not a, a, an auto electrician. What I do is I shut all the electrics down, I plug the generator in and then I um, once the generator is up to speed then I switch the electrics on. Before I disconnect everything I switch all the electrics off. So um, so like I say, don't. <laughs> there's no comeback if uh, you find that uh, you get a generator and you plug it into the van and it cooks the electrics. Read the manual carefully. However, it works for us. It gives us an independent power source and it means that we can uh, live off grid for much longer periods. 
So I also carry this. This is a 20 litre uh, water bottle with a, oh, if I can reach over, there with a, a filler spout. So filling up with water when you're wild camping in the van, the, I erroneously said that the water tank um, had a 200 litre capacity. I have no idea where I got that figure from, but it was completely wrong. The water tank, uh, the fresh water tank has got a 90 litre capacity. So uh, about four of these um, collected from a stream or if there's a place where you're allowed to um, collect water from a tap, you can uh, do so. We don't worry too much about the quality of water that goes into our um, fresh water tank. We obviously won't put in um, uh, terrible water, uh, you know, obviously contaminated water, but we're happy to collect water out of the stream because we're never going to drink that water. We're only going to use that water uh, for uh, cooking uh, and, and it will be properly boiled or for uh, having a shower or whatever. And this wee tank, it just fits just perfectly between the, the, the two sofas here and it creates a little bumper for the generator which sits there and I put the generator on there's a wee rubber mat there to stop the generator moving at all and it, putting the generator just forward a little bit the back wheels are here there's not a huge overlap and uh, overhang in this vehicle so it's got quite a, a, a good departure angle on it which is important if you're going um, on and off uh, these roll on roll off ferries um, sometimes when the tide is low you go down the, the ramp and then up and um, if you've got too much of a rear overhang you can catch the back of the vehicle uh, and that's certainly something to think about if you're putting a bike carrier on the back of the vehicle. Anyhow the, the rear wheels, the rear axle on this vehicle are just about there so uh, this generator which uh, weighs in at I think it's about 22-23 kilos something like that so it's a fairly hefty piece of equipment it just sits there uh, quite nicely and this is the, um, the wee bumper that uh, in, in the event uh, that it might move around, it, it stops it coming back and, and hitting the doors. But like I say, I put it on a rubber mat, which uh, helps too. So I'm at the rear of the vehicle, folks. It's all pretty uh, self-explanatory uh, here. So this is where the, the generator sits and the water tank in, in there. The, the rear lounge, this is the, the, the sofa here. Uh, two sofas, one on either side. And like I mentioned earlier, when I first got the vehicle, there should be some soft furnishings there, so it's got a higher back. I stripped all that stuff out because I just didn't think that uh, I would ever need it. So these two sofas come together uh, to, form, to form the bed. So this just pulls out here, and then you pop uh, this bit down there, and then the same on the, the, the other side. But really, uh, what I wanted to show you was that there is a lot of storage under here. So this configuration that I've got just now is really set up for our uh, Hebridean adventure. So what I have is I've got some camping gear in the far corner there. So I've got sleeping mats, I've got a little tent, and I've got a tarp, and then up in this side I've got my fishing gear, I've got a stripped down set of fishing gear, so I've got a few reels and some, um, what else have I got, a tackle box and I've got a, a, a little telescopic rod and then in the back there I've also got a, a small uh, rod there. I also have my pack craft in, in here and my life preserver and I've got a four piece uh, paddle and I've got one or two other um, little bits and pieces of paddling equipment, uh, ropes and uh, flotation uh, devices and, and so on. And I've got a wee bit of bushcraft gear in here as well. I've got a little bush buddy stove and various bits and pieces. So there's a generous amount of um, storage in there. On this side, I don't have very much storage in here at all, to be honest. And that's because I've got most of the area the storage space taken up with the um, leisure batteries with my uh, battery bank there but I do have enough um, space to uh, put in some things for van maintenance so a very basic toolkit and I have some screen wash and I've got uh, AdBlue so I can go uh, 
long distances, long periods without needing to service the vehicle. I always carry a toolkit even for a new vehicle. On this side, um, what I decided to do right at the very beginning was to put a mattress topper over the bed to raise the level up because I'm quite tall and I don't know if the camera is picking this up but you can see that the, the vehicle is narrower across the way here than it is here so actually raising it up a little bit makes the, the, the vehicle just that little bit uh, wider so the mattress topper raises the level of the bed up a little bit and gives me a wee bit more uh, room and um, and then some decent sleeping bags there but we also um, we have a, a blanket and uh, Mo has a duvet there as well so she's got sleeping bag blanket and duvet so she's covered for all seasons and a couple of proper pillows a couple of decent pillows so so the rear uh, lounge area so this is the overhead uh, storage bins and in this corner there is the um, controller and indicator for the um, leisure batteries to say that they're charging because there's a solar panel on the roof that's charging these up um, in addition to the the boost that they get when I plug the generator in and these there is more than enough capacity uh, for clothing for a very extended uh, trip what I tend to do is I start off with uh, all my clean clothes on one side and as they uh, get dirty they gravitate to the other side and then depending on what the day's activity is going to be I make a decision when I get up in the morning whether I dress from the clean side or whether I dive into the dirty side and pick something out that's not, uh, not too stained or dirty if I'm going to be in the hills or whatever and, and that you know, kind of rationing of the clean clothes uh, means that we were away for the best part of a month really and, um, and we, we had uh, absolutely enough uh, clothing. There's, it's exactly the same on the, the other side, two uh, overhead storage bins there too. I just want to show you something in here. So in here, there's a tiny wee cupboard, it's not even the width of my hand. What should be in there is a table that goes here, so you don't have to use the front galley. You can have your uh, dinner in the evening sitting here with a candelabrum or something and a glass of champagne. Well, that's not the kind of camping that we do. So I took the, ca the, the table out and uh, along with all the other bits and pieces that I felt that I didn't need and um, stashed them at the, in the corner in the gear room. And, and what I have in here is basically it's just a perfect place for putting my uh, my walking poles and uh, gaiters and and stuff like that so there's a whole load of things that would be you know ordinarily they would be quite difficult to store and and, and also potentially uh, a little bit muddy or dirty and they just fit in that tiny wee cupboard perfectly it just out of sight out of mind you can also see this, it's set up so there's um, there's connection for television but with a decent iPad and downloading uh, your favourite shows before you hit the road you don't really need a television at all so we've got some sort of fancy satellite dish on the roof here I don't know how any of that technology works just download some of your favourite shows onto your iPad prop it up down in the other end and we sit in the, um, in the captain's chairs at the front and um, we enjoy our dinner and everything down there and, and usually quite early in the evening after we've come back uh, from our hill walking or paddling or fishing or whatever I'll actually make the bed up quite early and so we sit down there until it's time to climb into the, the, the bed at the back. There is a a really big storage cupboard here and we use this one for all the heavy food so all the tins and things like that um, but also our boots can sit on top of that so our, our hiking boots uh, and 
I, I actually have my hiking boots in there along with Moe's, but my the boots that I use with my dry suit, I have a dry suit in there for uh, for using the pack craft. Uh, I keep them uh, under here with all my paddling gear, but my hill walking boots are in here, and then this just gets loaded up with uh, tins of uh, tomatoes and sauces and um, tins of uh, what else have we got in there? Lots of tins of fruit. I'm not really going to talk too much about um, food because it's not <laughs> it's not my area of expertise. But what I can say, and then the, the wee cooker there, we eat uh, very well indeed. We cook proper meals. We don't. It's not not a case of getting by with the food. If we're out on the road for a long time, we want to eat well, and um, and, and so. Uh, we we stock up regularly with uh, fresh uh, fresh fru uh, fruit and vegetables, and uh, the tinned fruit and vegetables are really a kind of backup, to be uh, honest. And in in terms of fish, the idea is to catch as much fish as as possible. So the the fishing uh, uh, during the Hebridean trip was reasonably good. It was very good, if you like mackerel but uh, <laughs> Mo uh, says uh, mackerel tastes like dirt I'm not sure that I totally agree with that but I'm not very fond of it myself to be absolutely honest I, I prefer Pollock and, and the Pollock pr uh, proved a little bit elusive but we, we caught um, we caught enough good ones so that we uh, ate fish regularly enough that um, it was satisfying sometimes when the fishing is really good and you're you're catching fish every day you get a wee bit fed up with it to be absolutely honest uh, with you so there we go well folks that turned out to be a more detailed review of the eldest cv40 than i originally intended when i turned the camera on this afternoon in summary i would say that for me as an outdoorsman, the camper van functions very well as a base camp. I'm really pleased with it. I would say the main thing about the vehicle from my perspective is that it's very livable. It's an easy space to occupy. It's comfortable, it's warm, it has good toilet facilities, has a good shower. It means after a long day in the hills or a day on the coast, day at the fishing or out in the pack craft on the water, when you come back you can clean up, you can put on some fresh clothes, you can have a lovely meal, you can sit back in the warmth and you can read, you can watch a show on the, um, on the computer, on the iPad and you can climb into a comfortable bed. And, and that's a real, a real bonus if you're going to be out and about for extended periods of time. So much as I love roughing it and summit camping and bushcrafting, and after a few days, it does tend to get a wee bit uncomfortable. Having some place like this to come back to makes such a huge difference. And from that point of view, it wins hands down over a self-build van. So whilst I miss the kind of rough, tough nature of my self-build where I could throw the gear in and then not worry about things getting scuffed or whatever, um, there did come a point, especially on the colder nights in the winter, um, when I longed for a wee bit of comfort. And that is exactly what this vehicle provides. So what I plan to do with the channel, getting back to the channel update and, um, and, and why I've not been filming for such a long time, I'm still working on this um, development plan for my future and I'll release more information about that as, um, as the days and weeks go, go by and it sadly is going to be weeks before I can really get back out and, and really get back into the outdoor filming. I'm, looking at probably the end of October before I'm free to to wander again. Um, I'm also going to run maybe a kind of mini series on the van so the van will start to feature a little bit more in the channel um, but 
for those of you that love the hill walking and the fishing and the camping, don't worry folks, because the van is not going to replace any of that. It's just going to enhance it. And once I get uh, beyond October into November, December, hopefully I'll have more time and uh, the vehicle will provide me with a base for more exciting trips. So I do believe that the channel is looking forward to an exciting late autumn and uh, winter season with lots of things happening and lots of opportunities to share some adventures with you. But for now folks I'm going to sign off, I'm going to thank you as always for tuning in and I really do look forward to getting back to you on the next one so please bear with me, it's going to be a wee while before we get back to kind of business as usual but it will happen so stay safe Dave Outdoors Scotland signing off for now. Bye folks.